Hello, and welcome to the All Things Narrative Podcast, where we explore the relationships between the stories we love and the stories we live. I'm your host, Derek Hatch, and let's get started. Everything they built will <laughs> fall. Yes, yes. You know, I was almost going to say mutant and proud. Oh, dang. Before, nah, until yeah. the uprising. Death to all muties. Let's do the apocalypse thing. Let's get it in. Let's, let's do it, bro. Oh man, we're going hard on this one. <laughs> Welcome to the All Things Narrative Podcast. I have some fine gentlemen back in the the room, the studio here, as we are going to talk about why we love X Men. So thank you so much for being here, and thank you for being a part of the All Things Narrative community. And if you want to get more plugged in on what we're doing, check out allthingsnarrative.com, where you can learn about our workshops, classes, our one-on-one coaching and yeah so you know i just uh, was telling somebody the other day i was like what's they were like what's the simplest way to explain what you do i said personal development that empowers people through storytelling so boom right Mm. there so if that any of that interests you if this conversation is the type of stuff that you enjoy doing then definitely reach out because we like to dive deep into these things and figure out why we love them. What is it that keeps us drawing back? And today is probably going to be the funkiest in terms of the story of X-Men mm-hmm. and, and in terms of trying to understand it because we've already done Marvel, right? Yeah. So we've done why we love Marvel. And we talked about basically everything like MCU related, Avengers related, Daredevil related. Mm-hmm. But we purposefully left out Spider-Man and X-Men. Now, Spider-Man is understandable, right? That episode was almost three hours. Yeah. It was the best subject. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> just trying to just trying to appease Derek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that episode, um, you know, was obviously gonna you could do a lot. Mm-hmm. And you know, with X-Men, X-Men is an interesting place right now. Because it 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 has, I believe, if you total the number of characters in X Men, it's equivalent to the rest of the Marvel universe yeah. combined. Yeah. You know, so it's a whole separate universe of itself. But it's also something where some people might be listening to this and going, like, really, like X Men, like top tier franchise, top tier. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. there is currently an interesting place that X Men is at right now, mm-hmm. where maybe it's not as culturally significant as it used to be, um, which you know we'll kind of talk about here. So, you guys ready to dive into this? Let's do it. Yep. All right. things up a little bit and start off with our personal introductions to X-Men today. So how did you guys first get introduced into this fine group of mutants and outcasts? Um, uh, mine was the 90s movies is probably initially how I got into the, the X-Men. The 90s series or the first? No, uh, like the 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 first movies, the X Men. Oh, so like the the two th- the two thousand the Brian yeah, the Singer, 2000, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah, yeah. Okay. really? Yeah. Not the comics or anything with you? No, not X Men in the comics. You're, wow. You were in humans and things like that. Yeah, I was in in humans, but yeah. the X Men when I watched the, you know, the two thousand movies, that's mm-hmm. when I really got interested in it. Um, because mm-hmm. I feel like those movies did a really good job. So, yeah, drew, and it, they were really the first. Um, in my opinion, like the first quality Excellent. movies that mm-hmm. they that they put out for, for superheroes. For, yeah, I mean, you had like Superman and you had Batman. Yeah. I was gonna say, which came first, X Men or the Spider Man movies? X Men. X Men. Yeah. Came first. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. X Men really is like the the first big name superhero, like Marvel superhero film. Okay. That absolutely. I mean, you have Blade. Yeah. But, but I would say that Blade was not an A list character oh, no. when that movie before. came out. Yeah, Blade did oh, come wow. out before. Um, but X Men, yeah, I would say X Men really is the the first okay, yeah. Yeah. of 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 those, and I really think it is responsible mm-hmm. for the superhero boom because Kevin Feige, who was, runs yeah. the MCU, was the producer yeah. of those. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think he did the the Raimi Spider Man films, as, so he did both the original X Men and Spider Man films. Wow, and, and, what happened? Yeah, and what's it called? And in those movies, he was trying to um, get different scenes where the X Men and Spider Man were in different scenes. Like there's 
like, oh, yeah. the deleted scenes of them where like the really? Sam Raimi Spider-Man would show up in like the X-Men. Yeah, they were trying to do yeah. something. Yeah, and it never clicked. Yeah. That would have been cool. Yeah. yeah. So cool, Dave. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so they got those movies. What about you, um, Jason? I think, oddly enough, I think I was introduced to X-Men through the, through the animated series. I the n- the 90s show, right? Yeah, the mm-hmm. 90s okay. show, which somehow... An, er, a, an earlier version of what you were reading or looking into. I don't know how I got into something older than what you were getting into. Is that an old joke? Yeah, he's old. <laughs> he has access to more content. And yeah, he was introduced He was introduced later than I was. Listen, Dave is what I call the seasoned vet yeah. of, of all this stuff, this right? The he's the one yeah. who can teach us. Pouring the salt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but... But for me, it, it was the animated series. I can't remember a whole lot of it, but sure. I just remember the opening sequence where, yeah. yeah, Professor X and everybody is rushing towards one side, and then Magneto and all his forces are against. Yeah, them. but I remember the movies more, and that's mm-hmm. that's pretty much it. Okay, movies. Yeah. cool, awesome. How about you, Joe? Yeah, mine are the movies as well because my okay. mom my mom loves the X Men. So oh, like, cool! Like every time the, it's funny enough, every time the X Men movies would come out. She would have us go with her, <laughs> go us go with her and like her favorite character is Logan and things like that. So yeah, yeah. so that's, that's cool. Yeah, this is the movies as well. Yeah, that's- for me it was um, the VCR, the VHS yeah. tapes. Yeah. yeah. So I had. Um, and, oh, what gosh, is, what is I that? I want to find these so bad because they were a collector item. But um, I had the first. Four episodes of the 90s show, the two-part Night of the Sentinels and the two-parter with Magneto and Sabretooth. Mm-hmm. Um, I had those on two VHSs, but the um, the VHSs came in this like deluxe like black and red cover. And then it had like a 10-minute like discussion with like Stan Lee and the X-Men 90s show creators and all that kind of stuff. So it was like a cool little bonus feature on there. Mm. But yeah, so it was the 90s show. And um, with the comic books as well, um, my first X-Men comics were actually like reading, you know, when, when, as I've shared on here before, like when my dad and my brother and I would get comic books, uh, my very first comic book that I picked out myself that when I, you know, because there were comics that like, you know, your dad would buy for you and stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, but the first comic that I ever went to the store um, in Escondido, California, oh, the comic book store, Hashtag store, it. right? <laughs> uh, um, was that comic right behind you, Dave, which is the X-Men number one, oh, um, which cool. I'll talk about that the history. Cool yeah, which I'll talk about the, the history of that in a moment. Yeah. But yeah, and you, I still have the tag on it. It was $5. Mm. And I remember that was b- r- stupid, ridiculous amount of money. Like $5. That's a lot. Like, yeah, when in 1990, probably 97, I got that. But yeah, so that was like my first comic that I went, I remember flipping through the the back issues and going, I want this. I want to take this home. I actually was more into X-Men than I was Spider-Man. Really? um, When I was first getting into comics. What? I know. (laughs) The Spider-Man love was there, but he was kind of second to X-Men. So X-Men was like my first love of comics. Okay. And not only with like the show, um, and and yeah, the movies came out, and then the X Men Evolution, which was another mm-hmm. TV show that came I out like as X-Men well. I like X Men Evolution. Yeah, yeah that was a dope we'll show. talk about that too. Yeah. Those, you know, like those early, like I've got some early X Men issues. Like I've got a number five all the way back there. You know, that's the the, um, the one that you see there with the snowball. <laughs> Iceman as a as just a, a just like a, a snowman snowball. throwing yeah. a snowball at Magneto. The no. furthest one where um what's it called where Angel uh, oh, looks man. like he's looking into like an hourglass or like a TV that one's something. goofy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this might be a good time you know to get into kind of a, a quote unquote brief history of X Men because it's hard to talk about the history of X Men without also talking about some pieces of their mythos as well. Mm -hmm. So like we've done different episodes, um, whether it was Stanley with Marvel, Mm -hmm. Walt Disney, um, George Lucas Mm -hmm. with star Wars. Right. So a lot of these stories are like, you start off here, you're the underdog, then you kind of climb and you come out on top Mm -hmm. and you show everybody, you know? So it's kind of like this trajectory of forward momentum. Mm. X-Men 
is really different from all these other stories. Oh. Yeah, the 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 mythos of X-Men is so tied into the history of it as well. So you remember the Marvel boom, right? Of 1961, 1962. Mm-hmm. You know, you have Stanley and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko creating many of the great iconic Marvel superheroes. So they get a lot of requests during that time of like, hey, you know, like the Justice League was just coming, like was just getting really big at that time in the early 60s. And so there was like that idea of like, you know, when are you going to do the the big team, you know? Yeah. So they did Avengers, I think, is Avengers 64 that they do it? I think 1964 is when they do Avengers. But before they did Avengers, they wanted to do another team book as well. But they wanted to take, they had all these like ideas for potential superheroes, but they didn't have them fleshed out enough to give them enough book. So Stanley, as the the sly kind of person he was, he's like, well, let's just form a team out of them and put them all in one book. So that's what he did. And um, eventually that became, you know, X-Men. So X-Men was created in 1963 by Stanley and Jack Kirby. Unlike Spider-Man. Unlike the Hulk, unlike Captain America and some of these others we've talked about, the X-Men was not a success at all. Oh, really? In fact, remember I told you in the Spider-Man episode that Stan Lee stayed on Spider-Man for 100 issues, Mm -hmm. stayed on Fantastic Four for 110, I think. You know how many he stayed on for X-Men? Six. No, not even that. Maybe. Um, 15. 18. Oh, I was close. Mm. 18 and he was done. Kirby lost That's interest. Wild. Yeah, him and Kirby both lost interest in it. They didn't see it as something super worthwhile. Wow. It was very much like a B or C list Marvel title. That's wild Whoa. to think about. And, oh, and it, and it, and and here's the right. crazy part: that first issue of X Men. Listen to who's introduced in the first issue. Okay. Hola. The first team of X Men: Cyclops, Iceman, mm-hmm. Jean Grey, Beast. Beast right, yeah. Angel, Professor X, and Magneto. All in the first issue. Wow. And then in the issues to come, listen to the other characters that get introduced. You ready for this? Because this is insane. Mm -hmm. To like look back on this and say, ah, we don't really care about this title. This this isn't, you know. Yeah. Issue number four, Mm -hmm. you have Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch that get introduced. Yeah. um, And Toad. Um, (laughs) that's for you Jason greatest meme of all time Um, you get um, in issue 12 you get the juggernaut Whoa! Mm. and in issue 13 you get the sentinels oh wow that's early yes yeah so you would think with all that wow we've really got something special here right yeah Nope. Wrong. Wow. Nope. And if you go back and read those titles, they're rough. Mm. They like I think I I wholeheartedly recommend going back and reading early Spider-Man comics, early Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. The X-Men, it's a bit rough. Okay. Everybody's a little one note. It's very much trying to figure out who these people are, which yeah. is fascinating. Yeah. It is fascinating to see the creative process. Cause the ideas are there. And the surprising thing is the designs are even there too. Yeah. You know, they just don't really know the story that they want to tell yet. Yeah. They haven't really like the whole prejudice metaphor, yeah. the yeah. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, that all like, I know Stan Lee has gone back and said that that was like, what they were trying it's really mm-hmm. not there though like when you read it yeah it's really not till later until it's kind of retrospect where they look back on those early issues and say oh yeah that's what that's, that's what, what we that's were, what we're trying to do but we maybe didn't know that that's what we were doing yeah so after they leave um it gets taken over by roy thomas who's a, a big name you know marvel guy at the time and neil adams mm. the artist who i told you guys in the batman episode mm. was responsible for starting to move batman in the 70s okay towards the direction of he is right i'm so laughing because i thought you were going to say neo i was like oh, oh I neo <laughs> <laughs> Bet. so you would think with roy thomas and neil adams great potential there mm. they could save the x-men right 
But and they do introduce a few characters, and they do you know the original X Men as you can see in some of those comics, they're in uniform blue and and, yeah. and yellow or blue and gold, right? Yeah. What smartly Roy Thomas and Neil Adams do is they're the first ones to give them individual costumes. So that's when they start to give them kind of that like more sixties kind of like look hippie, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, that kind of look, which is cool. Like that's the move towards more individuality. And of course they were wearing costumes, the same costumes. Cause the whole idea is like you're one team. Right. Yeah. Um, but then the direction on the book started to change where it's like you're one team, but all of you are individuals, individuals. as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now here's where it gets even crazier. When you get to issue 66, Order 66. it stops. Order 66, <laughs> right? It's it's a death sentence wow. in Star Wars and X-Men. Oh. Mm-hmm. Because from 67 to 93, and that's from 1970 to 1975, they just reprint old issues. Oh. So they literally stop telling X-Men stories for five years and just reprint and recycle old ones. Wow. Mm. And that in the comic book industry is a death sentence. Yeah. It means that your book is selling just enough to where we could justify printing it, but it's not selling well enough to where we could justify paying people yeah. to make new stories with it. That's wild. What are your guys' thoughts on this so far? I, I kind of knew that in the beginning, the X-Men series had like issues, but like was mostly to like the character of like Jean Grey. Um, because yeah, she was what, just like a yeah. damsel distress kind of character. And just like, again, like what you said was one note. Um, yeah. They were all pretty one note. Yeah. But I didn't know it was to like, to that extent where it's like, yeah, no, everyone just viewed it as trash. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And they had some pretty heavy hitters, but it sounds like they thought of all these cool ideas for powers and people. But mm-hmm. like you said, they just, Shot it all out, but didn't have much to, they didn't build up into it. Right. Yeah. Right. So the big change that came, it's also right behind you, Dave. Giant size. Giant size X-Men. So here's what happened here with giant size X-Men. Wolverine was actually introduced um, in the Incredible Hulk as a villain Mm -hmm. or anti-hero kind of in the Hulk. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he actually started off in the Hulk. Um Which is why a lot of people want to see Hulk versus Wolverine. There actually is a really good animated movie. Yep. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? I have. The, um, Thor, the Thor versus Hulk one and the Wolverine. And the Hulk versus yeah. Wolverine. That actually is really well done. Yeah. Really good. well done. That's some of the best animation Marvel's ever done, in wow. my opinion. I gotta go. And it's super violent. I think it's So it's true. like very... Don't show that one to your kids. You've got Deadpool in that. Mm-hmm. Like... Oh. Oh, but it's so it's so it's such a Wolverine great get his oh I guess it, his bones wouldn't really get powderized, but I can see him getting just thrown all over the place. Yeah, it oh, gets yeah, it gets, gets pretty pretty gets messed rocked. up. <laughs> yeah. Um but anyways, so Wolverine was already introduced in something else, but there was a, a couple writers, and one of them was an artist named Dave Cockrum, but there were a couple writers that were like, you know what? Let us try an, an uh, something with the X-Men. Like, give us a shot to try one new idea. And at that point, they're like, sure, why not? And the idea that he had was diversity. Hmm. Let's get characters that all come from different parts of the world and expand our idea of mutants on a global level. So in Giant Size X-Men, if you look at the cover, it's very symbolic what you see. Mm -hmm. You see in the back, faded into the blue is the old guard X-Men. Yes. And coming out of the old is the new, which features um, Wolverine, who's Canadian. Colossus. Colossus, who's from the USSR, which was incredibly controversial at the time. (laughs) You know? Nightcrawler, who's German. Thunderbird, who's Native American. Storm, who's African American. Mm -hmm. And the only one returning from the original team, Cyclops, but instead of being front and center, he's he's reduced to the back. Yeah. So in that cover alone, that changed everything. And of course, even the title of the issue, which was Deadly Genesis. So it is a new beginning that is meant to kill off the old, so to speak, Mm -hmm. and start over. So even in the title, there's that paradox of the old and a new beginning. Didn't the I guess possible spo- spoiler warning? Yeah. Did uh, didn't they die? The old X Men die like 
because the um the island blew up or something like that. I think they went missing. Yeah. Like they that was their first mission was that Cyclops was the only one they had and I think Professor X needed to assemble a new team um of mutants to go yeah. find the old team. But the old team um I I know I think Iceman, Beast and Angel all quit mm. when they see the new people and I think it's only Cyclops and Jean that stick around. Jean. Um, yeah, so with Gi- and then shortly after Giant Size X Men, the, the the other big change that happened to X Men was there was an up and coming writer whose name was Chris Claremont, hmm. and Chris Claremont was like, you know what? I I think I could tell a story with these characters. So once these new characters had been introduced, Chris Claremont kind of comes on as like a like an apprentice um, learning, and then in a few issues. Um, they hand the book off to him completely Uh and they say, go ahead and take it. And that was the best decision that could have ever been made for X-Men because Chris Claremont, you know, he turns it. So the original X-Men comics, I would say when they were at their best is about like a group of teenagers in a dysfunctional family trying to figure out how to use their powers. Mm -hmm. Chris Claremont went from that to um, taking the book into more of the realms of like a um, like a soap opera, like a serialized storytelling, where instead of self-contained issues, it was one continuous story. Mm. Now that had been done in comics before, uh-huh. but not to the level that X Men was, was going to do it in. Mm. It became more like this superhero, like adventure, sci-fi epic. It became an epic is maybe a good word for it. It it, it became big, you know. Mm-hmm. They would go to space, and that's when the Phoenix Saga mm-hmm. came in in issue one hundred. Um, and then, um, then they start developing like you know these other like storylines that start to do really well. Then they bring back characters like Magneto, and they start to start to tweak them a little bit, you mm-hmm. know. But then this is when, and that's all through like the late seventies. But then here's where things changed for X-Men. The Dark Phoenix Saga. Dun, 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 dun. That's when everything changed. Dun, dun, dun. They introduced a character. They introduced two pivotal, well, not just characters, but pieces. Yeah. So one is they introduced um, Kitty Pride, also known as Shadowcat. And oh, Kitty Pride. In- yes. Oh, okay. Um, right at the beginning of that. Um, and Kitty Pride became the reader. Like, that was since all the other X Men were more adult at that point. Kitty Pride became like the eyes of the reader, like coming in and seeing this world through new eyes. Yeah. Um, and readers, of course, fell in love with her. Yeah. The second change. There's three changes that happen. The second is they bring in the Hellfire Club. Hmm. They introduce those guys. So Sebastian Shaw, um, uh, Emma Frost. Yeah. Is you know. Hazel? Um, no, Azazel is not in the original Hellfire Club. He comes later. But he comes later, right? <laughs> and then here's the other change. So the artists switch from Dave Cockrum to John Byrne. And John Byrne had one thing he really wanted to change with the X-Men. So Dave Cockrum and had tried to convince Chris Claremont that Nightcrawler was going to be the fan favorite character. So we need to put all our eggs in really getting Nightcrawler off the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And Nightcrawler is, of course, like... Still one of the most popular X-Men, right? But John Byrne made a switch. He said, Chris, Wolverine is the guy. Trust me on this. He is the one that will blow up with everybody. Uh And there's an issue. It's it's part of the Dark Phoenix saga where all the X-Men are taken by the Hellfire Club and only Wolverine is left. And that is the issue that turned the tide to where Wolverine started to become this focal character of the X-Men. Wow. That's really funny because in X2, uh-huh. uh, Logan gets onto the ship with everybody and he's like, who's this guy? And Nightcrawler's like, my name is Kud, but in Munich I was the Incredible Knight and Logan just goes, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really kind funny. Kind of meta there. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. Oh, it's so, tr- Yeah. And then, of course, the big thing that happened with the Dark Phoenix saga that really put X-Men on the map was killing a main character. Now, they had done that before with Gwen Stacy and Spider-Man, mm. but Rip. killing one of your main 
superheroes Mm -hmm. with Jean Grey. And the way that they did it, the way that they subtly turned her character from the sweet, innocent damsel in distress to the most powerful entity in the Marvel universe. Yeah, multiverse, because the what's it called? Because the Phoenix Force is actually, mm-hmm. there's just one Phoenix Force. Right. Yeah. The entire multiverse. Right, right. Oh, wow. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, that. Mm-hmm. so that changed everything. Yeah. Um, and then, right after the Dark Phoenix saga, Cyclops quits the X-Men, and then they write another story. You might have heard of it. It's called Days of Future Past. Mm. Right after the Dark dies. Phoenix saga, <laughs> right? And the days of future past, you know, they, they established two timelines, you know, with X-Men. Mm-hmm. They establish, oh. you know, a future and, and the present. And they even um, start to hint um, with Magneto being in the future. Mm-hmm. They start to hint that Magneto, that there's redemption in line for him. Um, as they see him in the future helping the, the X-Men yeah, so, out. Yeah. Yep. Um, just like you see in the movie. Yeah. And then, after Days of Future Past, a couple years... And Days of Future Past is when they brought back the Sentinels. That's when they brought Mystique into the... Mm. Uh, who is obviously yeah. a very important character. She was actually introduced in something else. Uh-huh. I want to say Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, or... Because uh, Rogue was introduced to Captain Marvel. Yeah. And I want to say Mystique was too, but I'm not sure. Mm. But Mystique... Mm-hmm. And her new Brotherhood of Mutants, they all come in in Days of Future Past. And that's when the um, the book started to change into the prejudice metaphor mm. that we all know that it is now. Yeah. So that's when you really start to see the direction of the book change to where by the time you get to uh, God Loves, Man Kills... Which is the book that inspired X two? Yeah, that um, that, that book is, is brutal. It is an absolutely brutal storyline. Yeah, the movie does doesn't do it justice at all. No. Like, really, what, so what movie? do you so yeah. what do you know about that? Um, well, I do comic explains. You know, that's Rob is my boy. But um, pretty much the whole story is is that um, William Stryker he is a pastor and he uses his he's a televangelist. Yeah, yeah. and he he oh. uses his authority in the in that faith. The show, you know, um, hunting pretty much hunting down mutants because they're an abomination to like God. And at the end, um, what's it called? It doesn't end with like a huge battle, but it ends in a, de- a debate. A debate, yes. Mm-hmm. And um, and really, it was who was it? It was Cyclops. Cyclops was ta- uh, was the main one talking to him, right? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they all get to say something. Yeah. It's mainly Cyclops and Kitty Pride because mm-hmm. um, Kitty Pride's the young rebel who's kind of like cussing this guy out so to speak and cyclops is more of the voice of reason you know yeah um strike was he pointed at uh what's it called nightcrawler yeah that famous panel where he says are you telling me that god would make this or something like that make this abomination yeah 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 (laughs) Yeah. and of course nightcrawler being christian Christian. the christian in the group Mm -hmm. that's really harsh you know and and in the beginning it starts off with um professor x being taken no, Can, no, no. What's it called? Isn't it when... Um, oh, I know yeah. what part you're talking about. Oh, my so, God. I, I guess, okay, possible spoilers again. Um, It starts off with people that uh, follow William Stryker killing mutant kids. Like, they're hunting them. Mil- at the oh. playground. Yeah, and they kill them, like, while they're on, like, near... They school. actually, like, lynch them. That's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. And Magneto finds them. Yep. Oh. And that's how the story starts. Because there are some things... This is wild. <laughs> it is a wild yeah. story. Jeez. And the whole, like... Because, you know, like in the movie, like in X2, like Professor X um, is kidnapped by Stryker Mm -hmm. and and finds a way to get in his head Mm -hmm. to try to convince Xavier to kill all the mutants, right? Mm. But the comic book is so much better because what he ends up doing is he um, creates this whole vision where Xavier is being crucified like Jesus. Yeah. What? And he's being crucified by his X-Men. Wait, it's a vision though. Yeah. Yeah, but he, Xavier, it's his mind, so he thinks it's real. Um, so his X-Men are crucifying him. Yeah. And then he dies. You know, in the movie, it's like a little kid, right? Mm-hmm. And it's something... It's, it's his son. In the yeah. Movie, so. And then, but in the um, in the comic book, um, I forget who it is, what the image is, but there's somebody basically, like, telling Professor X that he needs to be cleansed and forgiven. Um, that he deserves the cross and that he needs to atone for his sins of being a mutant. And of course, that 
the trick is that he's letting Stryker and he's letting those entities into his mind yeah. so that they can tell him what to do. So it's pretty nuts. Yeah. It's pretty nuts, that whole book. And it's incredible. You know, that's when you get to see Magneto working with, you know, the X-Men and, and, and yeah. So by the mid 1980s, so after all these stories, mm-hmm. X-Men becomes the best selling comic book of Marvel. Beating out even Spider-Man. Wow. Really? Yes. So X-Men goes from being almost canceled and at the bottom to being, to being the best-selling comic book of Marvel. And it might even be, besides maybe some of the Batman stuff in the mid-80s, might have been the best-selling thing in comics in the 80s. The X-Men went, allow me to reintroduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And so they spawn <laughs> lots of spinoffs, New Mutants, Excalibur, mm-hmm. Wolverine solo series. Uncanny. Um, they changed the name. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I forgot to mention that. They changed the name to the Uncanny X-Men. Mm-hmm. Um, Why did they call them Giant Size? <laughs> Giant Size is actually a comic book. It's an industry yeah. term. Dave, mm-hmm. maybe you want to... Do you know... Giant Size is just that they when, they... when they started something new or sometimes an annual, they would make the story a little longer and a little little bit... They make expanded. it bigger. Like yeah. it would literally be literally. a bigger comic yeah, book. Yeah, sometimes it would be the actual size would be bigger or sometimes yeah. it would just be a thicker. Uh, that's cool. Uh, okay, yeah. I thought I just thought the X-Men were really big. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in 19, so 1991, <laughs> so that comic book right there, that X-Men number one. So in 1991, they make a decision to split X-Men into two comic books. So they keep Uncanny X-Men and then they start a new X-Men title and this is actually where Claremont finishes his run. Okay. And Chris Claremont stayed on the book for 16 years, which I think is the longest any um, writer ever stayed on one comic book. Okay. So 16 years wow. there. And of course, there's a transformation that happens because the costumes change. Uh-huh. And that's because Jim Lee redesigns the suits. Yeah, those. And those, those are the suits dope. that yeah. most people, when they think of X Men, yeah. that's the costumes they think of. Is yeah. Jim Lee's the shows from the '90s animated yeah. show, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, that Cyclops one is nice. So, and that X Men number one right Shoulder there. Built. Yeah, that X Men number one right there is the highest is the highest selling comic book of all time. Really? Yes. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the best-selling comic book wow. of all wow. time. That's cool. Time. So X Men in the early '90s. That's 1991, and then 1992. Marvel has a partnership with, gosh, I think it's Mattel or Toy Biz mm-hmm. and and Saban, which is a, a an animation company, and they of course create da na 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 mark the X Men animated series. Um, which fun fact, they tried to do an X-Men show in the eighties, Pride of the X-Men huh. and you could watch the pilot on YouTube. I saw the first five minutes. Yeah. What'd you think of it? Only five minutes. <laughs> That's all you can do. Um, yeah. It's not terrible. You know, it's, it's actually, the animation is actually okay. Yeah, for its time. Not, I, I, the animation was good. I didn't watch it enough to see if the story was there, like, uh, but the animation wasn't bad. I'm it's right. it's, it's most that. claimed to infamy is that it, uh, there was a popular video game that came after the show that actually was more successful <laughs> than the pilot was. Was it for the PS1? Because I had no, it's game. before that. It's for ah. like the the arcade and Sega Genesis. Sega. Um, but um, but then the other thing that's funny about that is that Wolverine is Australian. <laughs> <laughs> That's Boy, funny. Bum. Yeah, right? That'd be funny to hear. Oh, it's hilarious. She's not an X-Men. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty funny. But yeah, so the 90s show comes out, and you're 1991, 1992, X-Men could do no wrong. Mm-hmm. It was on top, right? Um, and they split the team between the two comics. They split the team into the blue team and the gold team. Mm-hmm. So you might have heard of this before. So the blue team um, was like Cyclops... Wolverine, Iceman, um, and and a couple others. And then the the gold team was like Storm, I think Archangel, um, maybe Beast. I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe I think Rogue was in that one. But yeah, so they split them into two teams. And so... um, Is this when Rogue had her like white costume with like gold in it as well? By this point, she had the costume from the show. Oh, okay. So... 
The, she, but Aroga came in the 80s, so that's when I think she had more of that look. Okay. But of course, it's Marvel in the 90s, so we all know what happens by now to Marvel in the 90s. After they do the successful Age of Apocalypse story, in 1996, Marvel files for bankruptcy, yeah. which we've seen time and time again with Spider-Man and the other Marvel episode, right? Mm-hmm. And um, X-Men, coincidentally, starts to tank. They can't find a consistent writer Mm -hmm. or artist to come on and do it. So it just keeps getting passed through. And after Age of Apocalypse, which is like a big event, they they don't know what to do or where to go. So they fumble around for years. And X-Men tanks back to that. The X-Men animated series gets canceled. And it all looks like it's over. It really does. Yeah. But then um, Richard Donner, who created the first Superman movie in 1978, his wife had an idea. To bring together a group of remarkable people. Yes. (laughs) You could thank his wife for the idea of, you know, I think there's something to X-Men on the big screen. Hmm. And she... Through her powers of persuasion, is able to convince Marvel and Fox to work out a film. Because Marvel yeah. sells their film rights, right? Yeah. To Fox and Sony, Universal, Paramount. Yeah. And Laura Donner goes to Fox and says, I think you have something here. Let me help you. Huh. And so it's very interesting that, you know, Richard Donner was the one who first did that with Warner Brothers yeah. and said, Hey, Superman, I think you have something. I think you can do superheroes on the big screen. She does that for Marvel. Mm. the power couple they're, to yeah, the max so they're trendsetters. and she that. has been yeah. the producer on every X-Men movie since really yes huh. so she's stuck with it the whole time it's been like her her baby you know um, for better and for worse yeah. so um, the X-Men movie gets greenlit and Brian Singer who's a really acclaimed filmmaker at the time mm-hmm. um, gets like brought on Ian McKellen Patrick Stewart yeah. these are like Big name thespian level actors. Yeah. And having their names attached to the project really elevated it. Hugh Jackman was a newcomer. Yeah. They actually didn't even know if they wanted him. Wow. You know? Can you imagine anyone else? Not for not for what they were doing, no. Yeah. But I even- could do a whole episode on Hugh Jackman. Okay. Oh, I know, yeah. right? Yeah. He's way deeper than X Men. Yeah, but, he is. Yeah. But yeah, he's a cool guy. I think yeah. one of my favorite movies of him is the greatest showman. I just I cry each time. No, oh, I love it. I know that guy could sing. Lay I Miz, mean, yeah. Lay, Lay oh, Miz, Lay Miz. He is fantastic. That I, is I the best movie. Did really? you ever? You guys ever seen that video on YouTube where Hugh Jackman is like singing and he's like, I think he ends singing like, uh, and I'm Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he's that guy's man. Well, yeah, right. What what a guy. Guy. <laughs> he that he didn't actually want to do regular acting. He was all for the. The singing. Yeah. And That's almost like the test musicals. of like a good actor yeah. is yeah. like, can you do theater? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. if you can do theater, you can make it. Garfield does. Yeah. Yeah. He Andrew does. Garfield and yeah. Does. Andrew Garfield does a lot of theater. A lot of these X-Men actors are actually really theater people. Huh? Yes. Yeah. And um, I think that's what's so awesome about him because then when he took, when he took Wolverine, he made it really masculine yes. and yeah. manly and yes. tough yeah. where you don't necessarily associate that with you know, singing. Yeah. Right, right. You know? So yeah. it, uh, that's what I loved about that whole story. It's pretty awesome. Now, even though the X-Men movie was successful, the comics still couldn't figure it out yet. So um, they brought Mark Millar on to do, after Brian Michael Bendis launched Ultimate Spider-Man, mm-hmm. they brought Mark Millar on to launch Ultimate X-Men, but it didn't take off the way Ultimate Spider-Man did. That Ultimate Yep, X-Men. that Ultimate X-Men okay. right there. Um, oh, that has a cool cover. Oh, yeah. Wait, I can't see it. Never mind. Um, they it's brought right. they brought over the infamous black leather from the movies, yeah. you know, into it. Um, black leather, the black leather. Because <laughs> who wants to wear spandex? Who wants to see spandex on a big screen? Oh, this I one's see weird, spandex right? On a big screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, so it's crazy because then they're really desperate at this point. Mm-hmm. Marvel is like, we have got to build on the X Men hype from the movie. So they greenlit an animated series, um, X-Men Evolution, okay. um, which is successful. Yeah. It does really well. And it's a great show um, if you guys haven't seen it out there. It is. It's, it's a really good. good. It's, a, it's definitely different in some places, but it's a good, like, 
it's a good understanding of X-Men, you know? Yeah. Um, even though there's certain characters I'm not sure about the interpretation. But overall, it's a really good it's kind of incarnation. Like, it's like, not punk rock, but kind of like that gothic. Yeah, it's that early vibe. 2000s yeah. vibe. For It varies much of yeah. its time. But, you know, between X-Men Evolution and the movie, they just needed that last piece of the comics to really get it right. And it was fun fact also with X-Men Evolution. Um, even though it was a, a, a Marvel show, it was mm-hmm. actually um, on Warner Brothers' Saturday morning cartoons. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, really funny. Yeah. You know? I even noticed that growing up. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is funny because Batman the Animated Series, a lot of people don't know, was actually on Fox. Oh, that's cool. It was not on Warner Brothers um, when it was first out. But yeah, so anyways, in a pit of desperation, they go to DC. And they look through DC and they say, who is the, the best writer that DC has right now? Mm-hmm. And of course, early 2000s, it's Grant Morrison. Mm-hmm. And they say, we're going to bring Grant Morrison over to us. And they told Grant Morrison... You can do whatever you want, With the X-Men. which is never that never happens in comics. Mm-hmm. Right. And Grant Morrison is like, OK, I'm really going to take advantage of this. Grant Morrison is what I like to call the last Jedi of X-Men. People oh, either love him and well, think he is exactly what X-Men needed, or, hate or him. people despise what not he did with the him. X-Men. Yeah, despise. Not here. I know it's a bummer. <laughs> Nick's not here for this. <laughs> So, um, and maybe that's an unfair (laughs) comparison to make. Oh, I forgot to tell you, they also brought Chris Claremont back. Okay. And even that didn't work. So they were really desperate. So they were willing to give Grant Morrison anything. And he came up with some really wild ideas in in his pitch. Mm -hmm. But what he ended up doing, so he was on the X-Men book, right? The one that's back there. And he started on issue 114. And he's like, all right, we're going to change the name to New X-Men. We're going to strip all of Jim Lee's artwork and costume gone all of it mm-hmm. and we're going to put them in like street level clothing um because the x-men are not a superhero team the they are a rescue operation huh. that runs a school and so grant morrison his infamous first page mm-hmm. shows on the top i maybe you've seen this dave on the top it shows um wolverine thrashing a sentinel um like he normally would and then Cyclops in a new costume on the bottom, looking very jaded and kind of, you know, I don't care, saying, of course, it's a very meta book in a lot of ways. And he says, okay, you can stop doing that now. And from there, everything changed. He changed the direction of X-Men completely. So Grant Morrison in the leading up to this series said, I'm going to tell the greatest Magneto story of all time. Now, keep in mind, Magneto had been redeemed, right? Yeah. Um, we They explored his Holocaust background with Chris Claremont. Yep, that's the panel right okay. there. Joe, Joe found it. They already went through a whole art with Magneto. He mm-hmm. even led the X-Men, right? Mm-hmm. And then he went through the the Fatal Attractions with the Asteroid M where he tried to create his own, right? So he, he sure Grant Morrison is saying... a whole space <coughs> station type. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, he, um, so then he basically... Says, I'm going to make the greatest Magneto story ever. And you know what he does? Huh? He kills him. <laughs> off, <laughs> off page. Oh. <laughs> yep. I was expecting that. That was, that's funny. Yep. In fact, you know what we're he does? Is he, has, he has a new villain. So it's revealed that it, Professor Xavier had a twin sister named Cassandra Nova. Oh, yeah. Who mm, he tried to that. kill in the womb but was unsuccessful. Xavier Cassandra Nova, him? yep, gets a hold of Trask's Sentinel program uh-huh. and uses Sentinels as nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. And they wipe out Genosha, which yeah. has 16 million mutants. Oh, and yep. let's not forget, this comic came out on the week... Of September 11th, 2001. Oh. Yes. Wow. Mm. Really? Yes. Insane, right? Yeah. Insane that that lined up there. It's all a the, 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 right? Yeah. So the, the timing of that is fascinating. And of course, readers who had been sensitive to 9 11, of mm-hmm. course, looked at that and said, holy crap. Yeah. We, this is going to be something. And the name of the issue was called E is for Extinction. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So then Grant Morrison takes the story from there um, and he develops. So you, the idea of like 
Xavier's, you know, school actually being a school with students and teachers, Mm -hmm. that was not in the comics. That was something they came up with for the movies. Hmm. And Grant Morrison said, we're bringing that to the comics. Like, why is that not in the comics? And so Grant Morrison um, really takes the X-Men in a completely different direction. Um, So much so that after his three-year run, they retcon everything he did. Why? Because it was so controversial. So they brought Jean Grey back from the dead in the 90s, right? Uh Uh-huh. So, of course, you would think Cyclops and Jean would live ha- happily ever after. Nope. He has um, Cyclops and Jean. He has Cyclops have a, a telepathic affair. I was going to say with Emma Frost. With Emma yeah. Frost. Yeah. Yep. Um, Cyclops was with Emma, bro. <laughs> you have Wolverine. Through the radio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Through the radio. <laughs> Jeez. Through mind radio. You have Beast. Beast and Beast. He That's actually where he gets a secondary mutation. But, oh. um, but... You you have a lot of things with beasts that are very controversial. Like you have a whole issue where I think he pretends to be gay because he's like, well, I should just do this. Why not? So there's a lot of like stuff they try out. Right? Wolverine becomes like they re- they retcon Weapon X and they say oh, really? that like, oh, it's Weapon Ten and Captain America was the oh, so they the do first, what was the first, yeah, yeah. yeah so they do a whole retcon of Mar a Weird. lot of continuity mm-hmm. there, um, and then they bring back Magneto. I don't want to spoil how. Um, but they find a way to bring him back and they, it's a long, it's a lot to explain, Yeah. but basically all of Magneto's redemption is gone yeah. when they bring him back. And so this run was so controversial that when he left, they retconned everything yeah. and they brought in a guy named Joss Whedon to fix it. Oh, sounds familiar. Sounds very familiar, yeah, right? Funny. Sounds like uh, Zack Snyder. Yeah. And oh, we don't like what he's doing. We don't so like what we'll he's doing. we'll we'll bring in Joss Whedon. He'll fix the problem. That's so wild, bro. <laughs> right. And so Joss Whedon comes in and he retcons almost everything Morrison did. Mm. And he literally has it in a, a very infamous panel in his first issue, taking over X Men, and he changes the name to Astonishing X Men. <laughs> But he has a title, a, a panel where remember Cyclops was the one who had that panel in Grant yeah. Morrison's run of like, okay, we could stop doing this now. Yeah. They have Cyclops backtrack and he has a meeting with the X-Men and he says, guys, we're not this. We're not that. We're a superhero team. We need to go back to what we've known. We've lost sight of. It. He's literally t- saying yeah. this and he's saying, we're getting our costumes back. Like, you know? Wow. It's super mad. It's just him talking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then after Astonishing X-Men comes House of M. Mm -hmm. So between Astonishing X-Men and House of M, X-Men is back. Yeah. You know? We're back, baby. We're back. (laughs) Until it's gone again. Because after House of M, they can't figure out what to do with them again. (laughs) So the X-Men tank. And because Fox is not willing to negotiate the rights to Marvel once Mm -hmm. Disney bought Marvel and started buying... Then the comic books start to nosedive yeah. again. But then now Jonathan Hickman's on the run and people love it all over again. Now X-Men is like another top tier title. Now there's movies that have come out, TV shows, even mm. an anime as we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, the anime one is dope. I'm not going to lie. Is it really? Uh-huh. I've been I'll watching it. it. It's it's yeah. good. Yeah. It's the Wolverine anime or is it? No, it's an X-Men, X-Men. anime. Yeah. Because there's a Wolverine anime there, too. Yeah, it's the same I, series. I, I, it? yeah, I was going to say, I saw that one when I was trying to, um, when I first started watching the X, X-Men anime. So that one's next. Mm. It's, it's, it gets, it's pretty dark, like, <laughs> like in that show. Whew, man. Yeah. To wrap it up. Essentially, the essential X-Men is somewhere of a mix between a story of uh, like a dysfunctional family Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out what their powers are and how to make them work. Kind of like an epic soap opera, serialized, you know, sci-fi storytelling and the prejudice, metaphor, racism and bigotry and being marginalized and all that stuff. And somewhere in between all that is X-Men. ask you as a fun little question now so imagine that you all um could write your own x-men comic 
Okay. Now, they usually try to have a limit of about five to six characters um, on an X-Men team at a time, mm-hmm. which is why the roster is constantly changing. So who would your ideal X-Men team be? If you could write an X-Men comic, you know, play with these characters, do tell a story, who would your like five or six on a team be? Trying, not, trying hard not to make a joke answer. Toad, Gambit, <laughs> the Blob, the Blob. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to spitball one. Okay. okay, go for it. Um, Emma Frost, Cable, Havoc, uh, what's it called? Iceman, Iceman, and Gambit. Okay, and if you could give them like a threat, what threat would you give if them? I can give them a threat. Yeah, it could be humans, could be a um, Brotherhood of. I almost humans. don't want to answer this. I can't even. Think. I want to say, I want to say something that has. Ooh, with. Mr. Sinister. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Sinister is the threat. Yeah, yeah that'd be cool. Mm-hmm. That'd be cool. Any of you guys want to share one? I, I'm going to go pretty classic. Like, I love Wolverine, yeah. Rogue. I would do Cyclops. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Colossus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, the last one would probably be Jean Grey. Oh wow, that's Jeez. very similar to mine. So I I like those because they all kind of have their different abilities. That I feel like could play off of each right. other. Right, Jean Grey is Jean Grey or Jean Grey is Phoenix. I I do like the Phoenix Jean Grey better. I yeah, me to, too. I have to be honest. Yeah, I, yeah, I do too. <laughs> so yeah, I think that would be it right yeah. there. And I, then as far as like a threat, they actually did it here recently. But me being inhuman, I mm-hmm. like the yeah. idea of inhuman and X Men. Okay, cool. So. That's awesome. Mine is actually mine is X-Men. actually like super similar to yours. I would take your team any day. Like I would take that team any day. Mm-hmm. But I would I would have um, I'd have Nightcrawler. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. Nightcrawler. He's probably my favorite X Men. Um, I'd have Nightcrawler. I'd have Wolverine because they have a good like. Kind of like the Deadpool cable dynamic yeah. where one is jokey, one's more serious, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but Nightcrawler can bring out Wolverine's humanity a bit, mm-hmm. and, you know? So there's really? like a cool dynamic. Yeah. Like you, you, the animated series actually has a really good episode where they do that. Okay. Um, so I love that dynamic. Um, I love Colossus. Um, but Colossus is like the strength, you know? Like yeah. you got to have the muscle somewhere on there. I would have Storm as a leader. Okay. Um, because I even though like Cyclops is like the main X Men leader, um, when Cyclops quits, Storm becomes the leader, mm-hmm. and I like seeing Storm trying to like wrestle with like this whole because her whole origin is like you know I'm not a leader like yeah. like she's been told all this life she's like a goddess, but she's also at the same time been incredibly vulnerable, you mm-hmm. know. So her having to learn that, I think that's a cool journey. And then I would add, um, I probably do Rogue. Because I just love the idea of Rogue as someone who, like, can't, they want human connection but can't physically have that, you know? And I love, like, Nightcrawler and Rogue being brother and sister. Like, that whole dynamic Mm -hmm. is really cool. That's a lot I didn't know about their dynamics. Yeah. It's a shame that the movies don't really. No, they don't. They don't do this justice. Like, I always tell people. X Men has some of the best movies, even better than MCU and even Spider Man movies, Mm -hmm. you know, at times. But if you want to fully understand X Men, pick one of the shows. Yeah. Either pick, and in each show will give you something, right? Yeah. So either pick the '90s show, pick the X Men Evolution, Mm -hmm. or pick Wolverine and the the X Men. -Men. Pick one of those three shows, and that's when you're gonna understand. You're gonna. That's when you're really gonna understand X Men to what in the comics what will what we get. You know. Yeah, because I feel like the movies. They really only did a, did a good job with Wolverine mm-hmm. as far as giving you a good background. Yeah, Wolverine and Rogue had a cool dynamic, I thought. But, yeah, but, but Rogue does not. But feel Rogue, it. Rogue is not that in the movies. Rogue is not Rogue. That's no, that, not at all. And they don't they don't do any really origin with her, yeah, really. and and they don't show her strength. Like mm-hmm. it's all about her questioning herself, which she does do. That is the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's just it the whole movie's about that. And yeah. it's it's she's way more than that. She's yes. like one of the I would say the one of the best X Men. She's Oh yeah, easily. She's become my one of my favorites. And, and she's as strong as like Captain Marvel, like Well, that's where she gets some of her powers power that she absorbs yeah. from Captain yeah. Marvel. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She just has that like she just has it. Well, she well, can she, she can touch anybody and take their powers, mm-hmm. and but like keep, for how and, long? Al- and always keeps she a piece of it. She yeah. keeps a piece oh, of it exactly. Oh, that's yeah. sick. Yeah, Rogue is OP. 
Yeah. All the X-Men are all so, but, but I think like that's where the movies were weak in that they didn't really show the the yeah. origin and the history of I think besides yeah. Wolverine, Magneto, and Professor X, yeah. yeah. There aren't any other characters that I'm just like you know, like, like there are characters I like. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know? Um, which we'll talk about when we talk about the movies, but I still can't say like that's the fullness of the character. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like despite all that they did with Mystique. The fact that they never addressed that Mystique was Nightcrawler or Rogue's like he she's he's, she's Nightcrawler's biological mother and mm-hmm. Rogue's adoptive mother. Mm-hmm. The fact that that was never addressed Ooh, in yeah. tw- in ten movies yeah. is an embarrassment. Yeah, because that is a big deal. Yeah. Yes, and the is. fact that they have Mystique and Nightcrawler sharing scenes together in X two where mm-hmm. they never talk about this. Yeah. The fact that they have Mystique and Azazel and yeah. they're the, the, like in scenes together. I'm like, just say it. Just say, or an X-Men well, you, apocalypse. You like, can't have your strong female character talking about how she left a possible child, you know? Yeah, yeah. like, like... They like, didn't have her even look at the guy, the red dude and go, huh, yeah. nice color. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah there's nothing, nothing. Like, to make purple. They, they yeah. do a little Just better. To make purple. They do a little better with Quicksilver and Magneto uh-huh. in Days of Future Past. Yeah. With yeah. the whole, like... But I hate that he never told. Yes, yes. agreed. Oh, man. Wasted opportunity. Yeah. Oh. oh my gosh. When Quicksilver says that line where he's like, I kn- my mom knew a guy who mm-hmm. could do I was like, Yes! Yeah. So good. But well, then he does say like that's my dad. In Apocalypse, but he never but he tells tell him. He never tells Magneto. Oh, he does it? Yeah. No, it's so He's bad. like, I'm 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 here for my family too. And I was like Nah, this movie. He's like, bro, I'm your, I'm your son. Stop okay, let's get into the movies now. Let's, <laughs> Wait, let's get into all that stuff. Team. Yeah, I oh yeah. Them. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. No, so I don't know much about them or the uh, who they are, their dynamic, but I thought of a really cool team. Okay, that would be kind of edgy too. So I would have Mystique, Nightcrawler, Beast, Ooh. Toad, and I think maybe Gambit. Yeah. I'm oh, not okay. Sure. But a lot of like low life outcasts, especially because a lot of them are discriminated discriminated yeah. against because of their physical form. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's all these opposing viewpoints, but they have to come together for maybe like a subterfuge mission. Mm-hmm. Mis- Mystique's been on the X Men before too. Has mm-hmm. she really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I think that would be really cool. Plus, there's like what two blue people, uh, three blue people in a, in a squad. <laughs> you just want to get all so the blue people so together. Make a joke about that in the movie too. All yeah. the blue barefoot people, and <laughs> right? No, but I thought I think it would be pretty cool. Just it's an edgier one. They have to come together. They have all these different views yeah. from yeah. a similar standpoint. They're both targeted for similar similar things. Yeah. And the threat, I don't know. Something that they gotta stop. A- yeah. Actually, just a quick note on Gambit, because yeah. um Dre's favorite character mutant is is Gambit. Okay. And he sent me a comic explained video. But Gambit's power, he's he he's is cool. Could, he could be an Omega level mutant. Because there is a point before in the comics where well, his power, he can t- he can take the kinetic energy out of anything right. and turn it into a weapon. So, like, anything he touches could be a weapon. But he limited himself so because of a mutant mask or something like that. I, I don't really yeah. fully deeply, but, like, Gambit's, like, over like overpowered. He can use his chair, take the energy of it, and just shoot you through a wall. Oh, yeah, yeah. easily. Yeah. yeah. And then he's smooth. it over to you guys um to kind of like briefly lead us in a conversation about some other some of these x-men you know shows and movies in more detail so i asked each of you guys to pick something right Mm -hmm. um that we're going to talk about today unfortunately nick couldn't be here and so we were going to talk about x2 um which i think we all agree that you know nick texted us that the nightcrawler opening scene is the best and that is that is a top five for me that is in the top five best x-men movie scenes yeah um even though, of course, that obviously goes against Nightcrawler's character, mm-hmm. but the scene itself. He was under control. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, but yeah. He was under control. So, <laughs> yeah, and you know, maybe next time Nick is on, we can talk a few minutes about X2 to get mm. that. 
Um, because I know he really wanted to talk about that. Snooze, you movie. lose. Guts. <laughs> ah, poor Nick. Um, <laughs> Cold but, blanket out here, man. Yeah. But yeah, so I want to actually have you guys so um, talk, we're gonna talk a little bit more, and this will kind of like also tie into what I ask every time about like how does X Men inspire you, mm-hmm. you know, to live a meaningful story, right? So we'll kind of talk a little bit about that as we talk about you know what we pick um, that we wanted to talk about. So Dave, I'm actually gonna have you go first. So what? Um, so we're not talking about comic books here because we've done quite a lot about comic books in this episode. So we want to go deep in either a show or a particular movie. So Dave, which one did you pick? I had the um, 90s animated series. Awesome. Um, which I've never seen before. I, oh, wow. I never, wow. I've never like – I don't know. In the so, '90s, I was in the Marine Corps and yeah. doing everything, so, so you I wasn't don't have watching like the, cartoons. So you don't have like the nostalgia attachment that a lot no. of people have. This he wasn't is, a nerd. Um, yeah, yeah. He was, yeah. He was but kid. since since started um, collecting comic books, yeah. and the uh, the Jim Lee series of the comic books, yeah, I kind of felt you know when I I took a chance on the mm-hmm. animated series, yeah, and I really loved it. Mm-hmm. It was. Way better than the movies to me, the whole series. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, the movies are what kind of got me into the X Men, yeah. right? Right, but the animated series was way better because it just told it, just really dug deep into the characters and mm-hmm. the storylines that you know you that you appreciate about yeah. the comic books, yeah. And so, yeah, that that was. It was just really amazing, and I got to really know the characters on a deeper level than I've ever really noticed before. Yeah. So, so. what are like some examples of that, of either like particular characters or particular episodes? Well, the first thing um, that comes to mind is Rogue. Um, mm. She has risen to probably one of my top X-Men characters. Oh, really? Because um, not only did she have the, the power, because every time she touched somebody, she keeps a little piece of it. Yeah. And so she has... An, and she has, she can, you know, in any, she can adapt in any situation because yeah. of that. So yeah. Because of that, she can touch a villain and take some of them and, and fight fire with fire, I guess. Right. But what I really appreciated was that her selflessness, like she struggled constantly with the fact that she could never, you know, touch anybody or have, right, right. have a physical relationship with anybody. Um but still, like the movie doesn't do that justice because they show that part. Yeah. But they don't show how she perseveres through it. Yeah. No, they and waste her. They yeah, waste her. She yeah. perseveres through that and becomes very powerful and a very key player in the X Men in almost every event they have. And yeah. yeah. So um, that's the first thing I learned about okay. watching the animated series was how awesome Rogue is. Um, they do like to give characters, and this is something I will say about all three of the X-Men shows, they love to give characters spotlight episodes mm-hmm. that really dive into them, which for an ensemble like cast yeah. is really impressive. Yeah. yeah, and they get into, they even get into, you know, her mother and how she, you know, remembered her it, and how Mystique kind of disguised herself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as her mother. And so they get into a lot of that with her, too. Um, but then there's also what I loved about the animated series was all the storylines. Yes, did. thank they you. Did, they did the Phoenix Saga, the Dark Phoenix Saga, mm-hmm. the Days of Future Past. Yeah. Um, they got... they they got into apocalypse. Yeah, they do apocalypse. Uh, uh, quite a bit. And um, so the whole... It was just... To me, it was just really awesome, the story. And, you know, I once I got past the idea that I'm, like, on a Saturday morning as a kid watching mm-hmm. cartoons, because that's what it <laughs> yeah. initially felt like. Yeah. yeah. But when when I started really getting into the characters and and, and seeing the storylines um, week, you know, episode after episode, yeah. it was just like, this is awesome. Yeah. And I can't believe how much I love it. And I, yeah. my wife would look at me like, what's wrong with you? You're watching <laughs> cartoons like a little kid. And I'm like, no, this is awesome this is writing. <laughs> I'm just telling you. This is art. There's, yeah. there's actually stuff in there that I kind of look back on and I'm like, wow, that went way over my head as yeah. a kid. You know, like you have like awesome. basically like the KKK yeah, of yeah. Like, that like goes and like hunts and lynches mutants. Mm-hmm. I'm just in like. the animated one? Yeah. 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 And no, I'm just I like, look and they literally wild. wear like the hood and everything yeah. and i'm like oh my gosh this went over my head growing it's up so yeah cool. and and they really do touch a lot on that about yeah. basically racism you know how they're muties the whole time they're you know there's a whole f- 
factor of people that just hate the mutants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so not only did they have to struggle with the evil mutants, yeah. you know, with, with Magneto and his group, but then, you know, even they had the to... Str- they're saving. Right. Yeah. Even the people they're saving, some of them hated them. Yeah. You know, so it, I really... In- I really enjoyed that because I feel like that was reflective of life mm-hmm. of, you know, if you're on the fringes or of your, you know, like, you know, in the sixties, it was the, the uprising to become, you know, somebody of substance and right. not just right. being pushed down as because of your race, yeah. that the, that's what their struggle is. And yeah. they're, they're, you know, it's just it. The whole the whole storyline is just really good. It's I feel yeah. like it's true to the comic books, and the storylines were really good. The art was really good in that in that in that. Can't series. go wrong pulling from the comics. Yeah, so I those, mean, those costumes are dope, and man. and yeah, I mean that really the artwork and the cartoon was very accurate to yeah. the to the comic books at that time, and so I really I, enjoyed. it. I was floored when I rewatched um, the Dark Phoenix. Because it's four parts. Mm -hmm. And I was floored when I rewatched it. I said, oh my gosh, this is almost beat for beat perfect. I'm going to have to go back and just watch it for the, what's it called, for the Dark Phoenix. The Dark Phoenix is, is, it really explains it. Because in the movies, there's no real explanation. Oh, it sucks in the movies. There's real no explanation of where the Dark Phoenix (laughs) came from. What it's all about. Well, the you, get into each different movie. Yeah, you just yeah. kind of think, oh, that's her power. That's your face. <laughs> you know, you, if if you're not familiar with it, you just, oh, that's just her power. That's just the way she is. You yeah. know, yeah. but it's really it's not. not. It's no. actually its own, thing. you know, right. thing, its own entity that's attached itself to yeah. her. Yeah, and there's a struggle within her to control it, mm-hmm. and and it's really really deep and really really awesome and and like you said that is a super powerful entity yeah. because it goes over multiverses mm-hmm. it protects the multiverses the stone you know it protects yeah. the stone that could destroy multiverses and so that's the phoenix yeah. main goal and so it gets into all of that and in really just what four or five episodes yeah it really digs into that and it, it's really cool the only thing that was really holding that show back for me is this is the censorship because it is a heavily censored show they, well yeah like wolverine they punch? like wolverine they, yeah, they can't get away with more than the spider-man animated ah. show but like you never see really wolverine doing any damage to yeah. any flesh it's it's, it's machines, machines and stuff yeah, yeah. So yeah, it it does kind of, but you know you have to realize at that time you know the censorship for kids it was for kids. Well, it's yeah. it's it's interesting so, because um, Batman had a lot less censorship. They were able to get away with more, and I don't really know why, considering they're on they were on the same channel yeah. at the time. I don't know why Batman could get away with more, but yeah, there was something about X Men to where they tried really hard to work around all these different things you know um i mean like there's there's a lot of things that if they made this show today which is ironic because they are going to make this yeah show. i mean do you know they're got the x-men 97 show coming mm-hmm. out which i'm hoping that there's no censorship on that so that can hold you know you see and the actual people now. they're yeah. gonna make they're gonna rectify the other big mistake i think in the 90s show which is not having nightcrawler be on the main team he wasn't no That's he's only in, he's only in two out Objection. of out of 65 episodes he's only in two wow That's which is a bad mistake which is bad because like Nightcrawler is like an A level top yeah. tier X Men character, but they're fixing it in the ninety seven show. I'm like, okay, he's there front and center now, you know. Yeah. So they're they're they they learn. But the Nightcrawler episodes are really good. As as Christians, I'm very surprised actually that a show like a mainstream show was that overt mm-hmm. about his Christian faith, like his Catholic faith, you know? Yeah. I haven't like, gotten that far in the animated series, but I'm really, it's going to shock you. It. Yeah. Like literally he's preaching the gospel. So we, um, should do, we should do a watching of the first episode when the, of the nineties, uh, the 97 show when it comes out, I'd be down. Oh, we I'm should, together. we should do the premiere when yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. My friend, um, my friend, Kyle, his buddy is actually the showrunner for that. So he said, it's going to be good. Um, <laughs> But yeah, anything else on the animated series before we go to the next? I think on the downside of it, there was a couple of episodes with Mojo Vision or oh yeah, the Mojo I just stuff. could not the, that, the guy with the like his eyes are like stretched out and it's like yeah a yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. basically basically Whoa. he made he he would make different universes a part of his 
TV, TV series. series. Yeah, it's like a reality yeah. TV. And I just like that. I just couldn't get into that. Like that was just like okay, <laughs> fast forward. This, this is really boring. <laughs> I actually like that because it's like that's so weird and out there, and it's just like this the, random guy's collecting. The, what is that? The, the, yeah. Sounds weird. The yeah, Wolverine I mean, and the I forget his name. Yeah, Mojo. The Wolverine Mojo. and the X Men show does it better. Uh huh. They do the. I think they do that concept yeah. better. Yeah. Um. But other, there, there other, definitely is some filler in the '90s show. Yeah. The first season's really tight, mm-hmm. and then second season, third season, there's a little bit more filler that they put in there. But it's all right. It's worth it though, it's because because the, that's when the the sagas come in, and okay. yeah. so they'll have they'll have the. You know, the long sagas and then a little filler, filler, filler. And then, yeah, it, yep, so that, that's it, a good, yeah. Yeah. So it's really good, though. Yeah. It's just Any, outstanding. Yeah. Anything else on the 90s show or, um, what is that? How does that, like, um, I don't know, like, you, you said that this is really like where you see X Men at its best, right? So yeah. What is it about, like, this show that I guess kind of connects with you personally? Um, anything else that maybe you haven't shared yet? Um, I, I just I like the teamwork that goes on and the struggle that goes on within the team, you know, because yeah. everybody has like their own perspective on how they should handle it, handle yeah, you different really do situation, see that. and you see the inner struggle, and but yet they still come together yeah. as a team. They often doubt each other. Sometimes they doubt, mm-hmm. you know, Professor X, what's he doing, you know, right, or, right, or you know, Wolverine who literally hates everybody yeah. at some point, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so, but, but they still get over it, you know, yeah, and yeah. they, and they come together as a team and accomplish the mission. Yeah, so good. I think that's what I really awesome. got out of it. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to go next and do days of future past. Days of future past. Um, so days of future past is not only my favorite X-Men movie, not only is it my favorite live action comic book movie. Wow. It's in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Which I know is a bold statement. Yeah. But um, I'll tell you why. Um, but you, we have. You, it's hard to talk about these future past without talking about first class. Mm-hmm. So you guys have all seen first class, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Great movie. Yeah, yes. I, I think first class actually is a better made movie mm-hmm. than Days of Future Past on a technical level. Uh-huh. Um, so like first class, you know, like it's very laser focused. Uh-huh. Perfe- Charles Xavier, you know, Magneto, like that. That's what it's focused on, yeah. And it knows what it, this, what it wants to do. Um, and it uh, it's almost like a soft reboot for X Men. It's still the same continuity, but their approach to making the movies changed with First Class, mm-hmm. you know. And Matthew Vaughn is really a big part of that. And Matthew Vaughn um, wrote the story for Days of Future Past for the movie. He wrote the okay. adaptation, so his work still lives on, yeah. You know, through that. Um, but. Yeah, so you set up this good dynamic between what makes Xavier Xavier and what makes Magneto Magneto, right? In first class. But Days of Future Past is like the X-Men movie I'd always wanted Mm -hmm. in my life. So it adapts a comic book story. And as I shared um, on the Marvel episode, I actually think, and I can only say this twice with any comic book, I actually think it's better than the comic book really mm. i it's hard for me to say that but really? i even i reread the days of future past comic just to make sure yeah i still i think the movie is even better man it is even better and it's better than the 90s version which i also rewatched this week and i love it mm-hmm. but the movie just gets me on so many levels so like besides like all the technical stuff like the writing yeah the directing the the acting my mm. gosh the cast is like top tier cast. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. a dream cast. But this is this is I want to talk about some of the things that I love. And you know, Jason, Joseph, we've got to watch it together. You know, so that's really cool that we've been able to see it. The rogue edition or the, the rogue, rogue cut, cut, right? Rogue cut. Which I think the rogue cut is, is better. Right? Yeah. Um, because I think I watched a different cut. You yeah. you watch the director's cut. What's the difference between the director's cut and the rogue cut? The director's cut is the rogue cut. And then... Uh, then there's the theatrical cut. What is the difference? About 20 minutes. Of? Screen time. Of movie. Well, yeah, what happens? I mean, there's there's a lot. I could probably tell you after the episode, yeah, like, all the changes. A lot of the changes... No, don't do that. But there, there's 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 a lot of little changes, but there's also, like, some big <laughs> editing change. Which I'll, I'll point out when there's a rogue cut change. Okay. Um, okay. So... But I love the idea of like, you know, you've got the time travel story and all time travel stories are essentially stories that are like, you know, 
they're all about the weight of choices. Like that's mm. what every time travel story is about. Um, but I love the idea that you were still able to take Kitty Pride, who was the time travel person, but they still, I, it, you know, it doesn't make sense in the movie logic to have her go back in time. Yeah. So Wolverine does make sense, you know, um, be, but they did the role reversal where Wolverine became the mentor to the Professor X, to Charles, who was struggling. Like, mm-hmm. I love that dynamic yeah. switch, you know, because it shows how far Wolverine has come as a character yeah. um, to get there. And... Um, I love, again, the mentor figure, kind of like Into the Spider-Verse, what we talked about. I love that idea of a mentor figure inspiring somebody. So, um, and it's ironic with Wolverine as well, because Wolverine is the one guy whose memory has been been, wiped, but he's the only one who remembers both timelines, the the timelines. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he has his like memory, like wiped again. He has his memory wiped again. Cause when he wakes up in 2020 you know, three into the new future spoilers, by the way, um, when he wakes up, um, he doesn't remember, you know? So it's like, he has to re it's not that he doesn't remember. He just doesn't know what happened in this new time. Yes, exactly. He remembers all of the wrong information at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, but that's a cool character thing, you know, Mm -hmm. like to give, give him that role. But yeah, so I, I would say there's three words that really describe Days of Future Past, like three themes that kind of overlap, which are sacrifice, mm. um, which you see in the first scene yeah. of all the X-Men in the future getting killed. When my mom and I went to go see that, she literally cried. And at first she was like, why is, why why are is they everyone doing? dying? <laughs> yeah. I was mean, like, I don't know, mom. I'm going to see. I'm, I'm, and then I'm you have to watch them get <laughs> killed. Good cinema. Yeah. You have to watch them get killed again at yeah. the end, you know, which is which is crazy. Um, but sacrifice, hope, mm. and mercy. And that, I think, is like the trifecta of superhero storytelling. Mm. Like, that's what I want from a superhero story are those ideas. Yeah. And I'll dive into those, like, all oh, what what I, what they mean in the story. But, like, yeah, I love the future scenes. They have their own distinct look. Bringing the old cast back is genius. Yeah. And it's actually a lot of the same future characters from both the comic and yeah, the yeah. 90s show, right? So mm-hmm. they got Bishop in there. Yeah. And, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and then you had the, the, um, <laughs> the 70s, the 1973 with the first class cast. Uh-huh. Genius. Yeah. Genius move, mm-hmm. right? Um, I love that both these time periods, I feel like, get the time that they need to show us exactly what we need to understand with the story. Well, more, um, in, the, more in the road cut because... More in the road cut, yeah, I agree. Because in the theatrical cut, there's less time in the future. So that's yes. one of the bigger differences. There's less time in the future. There's a lot less show. future scenes mm-hmm. in the road cut. Yeah. Um, okay. I love the idea of going to Vietnam and tying in uh-huh. Vietnam with it. Um, because I love the idea that Vietnam is kind of like this war, you know, America has to look at Vietnam and communists as like the other in order to justify like killing them. Right. And that's kind of a great metaphor for what Trask is doing with mutants is he kind of, he, he's a compelling antagonist because he admires mutants Mm -hmm. and he confesses that, but he has to, in order for his ideal ideology to work. He cause his because his whole plan is he wants to unite humans around a common enemy. Yeah, and that's exa- what Xavier is trying to unite mutants and humans. Trask is also trying to unite a group of people, but he's trying to unite humans within of and themselves. Yeah, and mutants he sees as the scapegoat to doing that. Mm. Right, and Trask, in order to do that, despite that he the fact that he admires mutants. If you notice subtly in his language, when he refers to mutants, he calls them it's. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even see them as human beings. He says, like, don't let it get away or don't, you know, like he can't even Mm -hmm. see them as human. It's like the little details like that that Mm -hmm. I'm like, they really thought this movie out. They thought these characters out, you know, um, and made them really feel compelling. I actually, the Sentinels, the contrast between the Mm -hmm. 70s and the future Sentinels, I actually, I think I told you guys this before, I actually got to stand by the the 70s Sentinel at Comic-Con. They had one there, and I actually have a picture with it. So I actually got to see it in person. And it really is a massive. It's a real. Those really? are real. Yeah, they're not CGI. I, so, love, I love that effect when movies do stuff like that. When you actually build it and then you put it in the movie. It just looks better. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, but you have that d- that tr- dilemma between the, the good mutants and the X-Men, the, the humans, and, of course, Magneto getting yeah. in there as well. So 
Xavier, you got to talk about Xavier with this movie, right? This movie, I think, is his best movie, like in terms of understanding his character. Mm -hmm. Even better than First Class, because we see that Xavier in the past, he literally has to take a drug, yeah. which this is fascinating here. He takes a drug that gives him back a piece of his humanity that he lost, right, yeah. with his legs, the, which was the sacrifice for his dream, mm -hmm. you know. But it also, ironically, g despite giving him a piece of his humanity, it takes another piece of his humanity away. Yeah. Which is, of course, his ability to connect with people through empathy, through his telepathy. Mm -hmm. um, he can no longer connect with people, both literally and mutant power-wise. Yeah. He cannot connect with them. So he can have one piece of his humanity that makes him like everybody else. But the thing that makes him special and unique, he's suppressed it. Yeah. Which I think is like a huge like metaphor for like when you get older, you know, and it's like you try to like you kind of like want to just fit in and go with what everybody else is doing. So you suppress that piece of yourself. It's kind of like bearing your talents as well. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, and, and it's a story of him learning. He has to learn how to reconnect mm -hmm. um, with his power, but with humanity as a whole in order to save not just mutants, but to save humanity yeah. as well. And so, like, you know, the scene with the two Xaviers, right, mm -hmm. with him and Patrick Stewart. Yep. Patrick Stewart says just because someone stumbles and loses their path doesn't mean they're lost forever. Sometimes we all need a little help. And then the young, you know, James McAvoy, you know, he says like all these voices, so much pain. And you can feel the emotion yeah. as he's saying that, you know, um, and it's not their pain you're afraid of. It's yours, Charles. And as frightening as it can be, that pain will make you stronger. Like, yeah, that's that's I mean, think about for like, you know, the like, like being in ministry and the work mm -hmm. that you do, their pain be, learn, learning to bear their pain because that's what he says right if you allow yourself to feel it embrace it it will make you more powerful than you ever imagined it's the greatest gift we have yeah. to bear their pain without breaking and it comes from the most human part of us hope and charles we need you to hope again wow and how the whole future hinges on this man's choice yeah his ability to hope again. It shows how powerful hope is, mm -hmm. you know? Dang. That helps me for when I'm going to talk about Logan. Yeah, when we yeah, get to Logan, it's... right? And, and you know, you get to see, like, a, just a couple other things I'll talk about is, like, I love, like, Magneto. You get to see, like, Magneto in the future where he's been redeemed and he's atoning, trying to make things right. Um, but in the Rogue Cut, which is another thing I love about it, you have that scene where he's trying to save Rogue. Um, him and Iceman are going in yeah. the X mansion to, they're breaking in to save, um, a mutant, right? To save Rogue. And at the same time, it's cut with the past with Michael Fassbender's mm -hmm. Magneto going and breaking into another building to retrieve his helmet and all that in order to put down a mutant in order yeah. to, to go to the, the White House and to stop Xavier and all them. So it's like this irony of like the, the contrast between the Magnetos. And then Magneto gives that speech, yeah. which Michael Fassbender, the fact that that man has not been nominated for an Oscar for anything oh, is, so good. is insane. Mm -hmm. Michael Fassbender is like a top tier actor. Yeah. Um, but when he gives that speech, when he drops the stadium yep. and he gets the medal in the Sentinels, as if that isn't cool enough yeah. and he's wearing purple. But then that suit is dope. It's mm -hmm. so yeah. dope. But then he gives the speech. Yeah. He turns the cameras and he gives that speech. And as he's giving that speech, it shows that the future is it's bleaker so than awesome. ever as Magneto is trying to save all the X-Men in the future. We see that his ideology that he's speaking in the speech is what will cause this future to come to fruition. Yeah. So like the editing, like the editing in this movie doesn't and get the enough. Music. Oh, and the music, yeah. John Ottman's score. Yes. It's so, so good. You built these weapons to destroy us. Yes. Why? <laughs> yeah it shows that magneto has something in common with trask mm -hmm. you know they're both willing to wipe out you know um 
But yeah, and so and then of course you got to talk about this final scene where you know Mystique is the one who's going to pull the trigger, um, which we see in all the adaptations. Mm -hmm. The way they do it, and this is the moment that makes it better than the comic or the show. This the story. When Xavier goes to Mystique and he says, you know, I've tried to control you all your life, but I'm not going to. And, and, you know, and Mystique makes that choice to show mercy. Mm -hmm. Because in both the other adaptations, it's just a fist fight. And it's like every other story. But this is what makes this so unique. The villain, the antagonist, you know, whatever you want to call Mystique here, because she's in the middle. She's caught in the middle between Xavier and Magneto's ideology. But she shows mercy, and an act of mercy changes the course of history. Mm-hmm. If that isn't a good story, yeah. I don't know what is at that point. So that choice, I mean, it's just so powerful. And you know, Beast says, you know, what if she's meant to do this? What mm-hmm. if this is who she is? And Xavier refuses to believe that. I love that idea. Yeah. Because we could get into that idea of just thinking of people as one story. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just who she is. Maybe no matter what you do, you can't change it. But it shows that you can. And that cycle of hatred is broken. Yeah. Anything else on Days of Future Past? Anything you guys want to share about or... Yeah. Anything you guys like? Uh, the Quicksilver scene. Oh, Can I yeah. talk about that too? Mm-hmm. That I think is like a really inspired piece of filmmaking. Like if every mutant got that level of love to showcase their powers as you do in the, the kitchen scene with Quicksilver, mm-hmm. man. So yeah. Anything else on Days of Future Past? Just an emotional movie. Very emotional. Very emotional movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Joe, I'm going to have you go next. What do you got? All right. So my movie is... Uh, takes place in the new timeline. In the new timeline, um, after they reset everything, and yeah. it you is get that X-Men. very, you get that very hopeful future, yeah, you right? Get the hopeful Where future. Everybody's back and... until it leads to Jason's movie Logan. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. But my movie is Apocalypse. So uh, did... everything they built well, will fall. Listen. So what I did. So what I did. I just like went through when the movie was playing, and I just did brackets. I just did bullet points. Sure. Right so I'm just going to read what I wrote throughout it all. Do it. Um, so this is kind of at the end, but I said that these have the best costumes at the end with all the new. Yes. Mm-hmm, with all the newer cast. Why said, on earth did they not use yeah, those and, costumes and for the final? Ba- for the they put movie. them in the most generic black. Yeah. Like jump. They look worse than the black leather. Yeah. I'm sorry. They are the worst. That, no, 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 no. The oh, the see. suits they wear in the final battle with Apocalypse. That is the ugliest. Yeah. And, and Apocalypse is worse than yeah. dope costumes. Yeah. No. Like Archangel, Archangel Psylocke, so Magneto. I, I, listen, so like I said, like I love the Egyptian. I love the Egyptian stuff. I wish yeah. they did more of it with Apocalypse in the future. Yeah. Um, oh, the, that the score in yeah. the Egyptian scene is so good. Yeah. I said the um the horsemen were brutal. Like yes. when they were just like protecting. And it was Apocalypse. a good, good, solid like four horsemen. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like. They had some OP powers. Like, one could, like, control fire. One could literally, like, just, like, manipulate, like, people pretty much. Apocalypse picked a good batch, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Um, the scene where Eric loses his family. Oh, course, my gosh. It's so sad. I cried Jeez. through it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is, like, the, the best, like, I think Michael Fass. besides, like, Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart, I think Michael Fassbender is the really? MVP. Just, I mean, like, because it's, it's, it's worse because it's a woman who accepted Eric. For his past. Yeah. And then, like, also afterwards with Magneto just going, like, nuts. Mm-hmm. And just, like, literally just using the same necklace he gave to his daughter. <sighs> like, is, are, is someone going to take you away, Papa? It's like, no one's going to take me away. And then they try to take him away. And then she dies. Uh, just He's so like, literally screaming at God. Is this what you want? Yeah, like, man. Oh, it just makes me cry. Yeah, that scene is so good. Um, I hate that Hank isn't blue. Like how they just do the normal Hank instead of doing like the actual beast. Well, you know what? Why though, right? No. After first class in Days of Future Past, uh-huh. Jennifer Lawrence and Nicholas Holt were bigger actors then. Oh. Uh-huh. And so they had a lot more negotiation. And so one of their negotiations for Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix was we want less scenes blue. So that's why they're human a lot of the movie. Yeah. Yep, be, I know. be the part of, just do the costume. Those it's funny because those are the two that had to struggle of looking like 
Yeah. They're being comfortable with looking how they I, actually I, are. Like, yeah. oh, you're supposed to be proud of Mystique. I, and then Jennifer Lawrence is like, yeah, I don't actually want to be Yeah, it's that. very ironic, right? I actually think that's their worst movie yeah. for both of them. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Dark Phoenix from Jennifer Lawrence is pretty I mean, but she too. dies, so like, who really Yeah, cares? right? <laughs> who really cares about that one? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, uh, well, I mean, sorry for everyone that gets spoiled. About <laughs> movie, but she dies um, in a good way. Yeah. Um, Jubilee is Wasted. Jubilee. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. Have you seen the deleted mall scene? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why is that not in That's the movie? It should have been, I, I feel like it should have been more focused on the younger cast. You're focused, yeah, you're bringing yeah. in Scott, you're bringing in these people. But Nightcrawler, still, Storm, yeah. Jean Grey. Yeah, but the, they still were focusing more on the older cast at this time. Which Apocalypse is the most frustrating X-Men movie for me. Yeah. Because it has some really good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's got some really, cause Brian Singer, he gave up making the movie. I don't know if really? you know No, that. I didn't know that. He actually s quit directing it. Really? In the middle of it. And Simon Kinberg had to c take over and do ghost directing for him. So that's why a lot of that stuff isn't really developed. And uh -huh. a lot of that stuff is messy. Brian Singer literally gave up. Wow. He, he gave up in the movie. Huh. Crazy. That's wild. Yeah. So I said, Gene sucks. In all the X Men movies, Gene sucks to me. They don't. Uh, they they never get her right. Yeah. Um. They had to put a Wolverine cameo in, but I feel so, like yeah. What did you best, think of it? I think this is the best Wolverine cameo because it's like you get a little hint of Logan, like with the actual brutality of it. Because it's yeah, like, like the X twenty four. Yeah, right. It, you it's get... a pretty brutal like um like what is it? Yeah. They like tested the waters with it. Yeah. They really did. And then. <laughs> When um when Jean and Logan interacted at the end, um I was like Jean got a uh, what's it called? She got a type of man in that moment. Oh, it's so weird. Yeah, that, it's really weird. That scene is weird. Yeah, yeah she's a little young for him. <laughs> um, I said Apocalypse and his goons have have the drip, like again because their costumes. Oh are my really, gosh! Really dope. Do you do you remember the um? So there's a scene uh -huh. um where Apocalypse um gets into Cerebro. Yes. That's that one of my favorite scene scenes. Yeah. Is I, I so, put that in one of my favorite scenes. So that scene, like the music, because they take Beethoven's Seventh Symphony for yeah. that. And oh my gosh, like the that scene is so good. Yeah. It's great Stan Lee cameo with him and his wife um in there. And then I like how um it also shows like in the movie Magneto is like really like how powerful he is. Yes. Because he can yes. literally control the earth. Right, right. Like that's so that's really, really cool. And then at the end with Storm and Magneto. Like, they're murderers, but everyone's like, it's okay. <laughs> you can be part of the X-Men. It's okay. You, you, you killed billions of people, people but it's right? all right. Oh, man. You guys are X-Men now. So, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. I really love Apocalypse because it's just one of those, like, X-Men movies where it's just like, you could just sit and watch it, and it's just like, and it's just fun. It's a fun Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse, yay or nay? <sighs> Nah, not really. I wish they had someone bigger because yeah, the Apocalypse is bigger. And I don't think he was the right choice. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have for Apocalypse. Yeah, I yeah. think my last thing on Apocalypse is the, the thing that's like the perfect thing to summarize how I feel about this movie. The scene where he takes over. Oh, and I love the scene where um, they have the mind battle. Yeah. In the astral plane. Yeah. That's never been done in an X-Men movie before or since, really. Mm -hmm. I love that. But um, when Apocalypse and Xavier, when he gets in in Cerebro and they have this really dramatic scene and the X-Mansion's going to blow up and the stakes are high. Yeah. Quicksilver shows up and puts on Sweet Dreams. That tells me everything that's wrong with this movie. Mm. It's tone deaf. It's tone deaf as hell. Like, you have this scene where potentially people are going to die. Yeah. And it's played up for, like, comedy. Like, right after... Like, the tone shift is so jarring. Mm -hmm. And then, right after that scene, which is supposed to be a comedic scene... With the Quicksilver yeah. scene. Havoc dies. dies. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, this is, like, a big character in your series. Yeah. Nope. We're going to gloss right over that. And move on to the next, next thing, subplot, yeah. which is we have to get all the mutants into work, um, to go do the Wolverine to cameo. go do the Wolverine yeah. cameo. <laughs> and there's no like crap. What are we gonna do with yeah. all these mutants here? Crap. What are my, I just lost my brother? Yeah. Because like that tell that that three like those three things like back to back. Yeah. Is like everything that like I get frustrated with with this movie because like 
Like, who is the main character of Apocalypse? No one. Exactly. There's no, like, POV. There's It's just Apocalypse, a bunch of stuff yeah. happening. Maybe at first, you at say first it was no, At first it was Cyclops. You, they make like, you they, think it's yeah. going to be him, but then they drop, like you said, yeah. they drop so much of that. But anything else on Apocalypse? Is it Logan time? It's time it's for Morgan the end. It's <laughs> Morgan time. Morgan time. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Alright, tell us about Logan, Jason. Oh man, I I watched it two more times in the last week or so. Because oh, yeah. we but, watched it in black and white for those yeah, who are listening. Logan Noir, which I don't know if that was like a cool thing for me or if I should have watched it in color first and then in Noir. Because um, watching it for the third time after Noir was weird. But nothing tops the very first time that I saw it. And I yeah. see... Logan with scars, mm-hmm. which is really weird. Yeah. Just hobbling. It's all bleak. And then I see Professor X just oh rambling gosh. like a yeah. madman, talking yeah. about ta- a Taco Bell commercial and just not recognizing Logan. And then he looks up and hit. Look at looks up at him and goes, "Who are you? You're the man who puts me to sleep." And he falls in his wheelchair and he's struggling and has the seizure. And just Logan has to stab him and put him in a bed. And he's cussing. Like, Professor X cussing. You could tell was a that they were waiting thing. to make an R-rated yeah. X-Men movie like this. Because yeah. they just, they, went through they through. go all yeah. out. The, the, it's going to sound weird, but I felt that to show what they wanted to show, Professor X had to go from this perfect symbol of wisdom, of poise, right. and knowledge, and... And just fluency in language, you're gonna go. We're gonna make him cuss and broken and old. And the thing is, he's always usually like a perfect bald. And mm-hmm. this, he's got hair yeah. on the side. He's got kind of fuzz. He has the liver spots. His right. eyes messed up. This is a completely broken man. Mm. Yeah. And Logan is just taking care of him until he dies. And then he. Uh, you're just waiting for me to die. That, you're just yeah. waiting for me to die. How long have we been here? Gosh, man. Um. What did you do? Like, he's just yelling at him. He even called uh, Logan a disappointment. Yeah. And it's just, you just see everything decaying. That whole movie is about the decaying of hope. But that was a That's really cool thing that you said is that in these movies, Professor X is the symbol of hope for humanity and mutant kind. Right, right. He always represents that. And it's fitting that in this movie, he's still alive, but he's completely broken Mm -hmm. and useless and not functioning. And Logan is just kind of back to where he started. He had this family. It's gone now. And he even says that. And I I noticed something interesting when when I played it again. You guys probably already knew this. But when it talks about the incident in Westchester Mm -hmm. on the radio, it said that 600 people were injured, Mm -hmm. including... It says Six. killed, I believe, right? No, no, no. So 600 are injured, and then it said several um, were killed. Inclu- are, um, however, Six something are killed, uh, as well as several members of the, the X-Men. X-Men, yeah. X-Men of yeah. the, and then it just cuts yeah. out. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, Professor killed some of the X-Men. That's crazy. Yeah. But no no humans were killed. Right. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think it says much more of that incident. Yeah. I think it just kind of leaves it up. To... Well, there, yeah, there's a lot of things in the movie that you kind of have to put together, yeah, like, mm-hmm. upon multiple watches. So, like, the corn, like, there was a random comment mm-hmm. about harvesting corn and then putting it in everything. And then they have the the line that the Dr. Xander Rice says, where he says to Logan, like, it was corn syrup. We put it in there. And then, and I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, that's how they eradicated the mutant yeah. gene. Yeah. And really? I was like, yeah. I didn't even- so that little line about corn in the field, right, yeah. actually has a payoff when Xander Rice says that's why they harvest all the corn and they put it in cereal and they put it in everything mm-hmm. because that's how they killed the the mutant gene. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's why uh, the guy with the robot hand, I wish I remembered his name. He was cool. Donald. Donald Blake. Donald. He said, uh, hey, show some respect. He's the guy who wiped out your kind. I'm like, yeah. how did he do that? Why don't they tell us? And then I guess I missed that. Yeah. There's a lot Three of watches. Logan. Get it together, Jason. Logan, yeah. Logan is the only superhero movie that's been nominated as an Oscar for best screenplay. Mm-hmm. And it's a hundred percent deserved. Yeah. Because this script, like this, you know, yeah. it is so tight and focused. 
And there is so much that I pick up watching in layers, Mm -hmm. you know, like Mm -hmm. it knows exactly what it wants to do. It wants to do the old man, Logan Western It wants to do it. And it does it so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I really liked it. And I loved how professor X is like saying, Oh no, what about this? Like we have to go back for Laura. We have to go back. He's got a little piece of hope left. And Logan Mm -hmm. is like, no, but he's thrown it all away. He's bitter. He's he's damaged. He saved the bullet to to shoot himself. Mm-hmm. Like he's given up. Yeah. Otherwise he would have thrown that thing away. But it's funny because at the end, that is what saves him, and he does. Yeah. He, right. It does end up killing himself. Yeah. But it was the part of himself that was without humanity. He yeah. killed his own animalistic like weapon past. Yeah. Because that, a- which is ironic, which is what killed it. Professor X was that. Yes, yeah. yes. Was that lack of humanity. It was the anger and all the bitterness. That's what killed the thing that was spurring him on to, towards hope. And he had to make the decision himself. And, and, and he killed it. Actually, no. Yeah. Laura, Laura did. Laura did. Yeah. His, his daughter, yeah. the thing that he was hail marrying into the future is what killed his past. It wasn't him. He couldn't do it himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The whole X-24 thing is is wonderful. It gives mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman another type of performance, which how he never got nominated for any awards for this movie is yeah. baffling to me. But I know the original plan was they wanted to bring... Um, um, Leave Schreiber back to do Sabretooth for that. That would be, yeah, and I, I, I heard that too. I think, and I think the X24 works better yeah. Yeah. in terms mm-hmm. of the story yeah. it does. they're telling. Oh my gosh, watching well, him. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, they, for the future of the of the movies, they, they kind of have to bring in her, you know, because mm-hmm. right. Hugh Jackman's on his way out the door, you know, yeah. and so they have to bring in a, a another version of the Wolverine. She's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, she's she, amazing. She doesn't talk two thirds of the movie. And does a lot of her own stunts. When she yeah. does, it's hilarious. Yeah. It's like, what, what's all this bullcrap been 2,000 friggin' miles ago? And she just starts going, nah, 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 and just starts railing at him. Yeah. That was funny. And then she just hits him in the face. Yeah. So, well, and the other thing about yeah, her, like the, one other thing about her is she is the extension of hope that he lost. Mm-hmm. Because there is a glimmer of hope when, when Professor X, you know, his self comes out for just long enough yeah. to recognize that she's yeah. the future. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then that's a sign. Okay. There's still hope. And then once, uh, Logan recognizes it, mm-hmm. then it's like, almost like that, that Bible verse where, uh, it says children are like a quiver, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. arrows in a quiver. That's kind of what he was doing with those kids. He's like, okay, this is our future. I'm going to protect them right, and right, get right. them to where they... So it's really cool. I, yeah. I really love that whole thing. Do you, now, Jason, do you have... Um, there's like kind of like five anchor points of the movie. Like there's the initial scene where Logan in the limo gets, you know, in the fight. Mm-hmm. There's the, the, the desert brawl where the, you first see Laura unhinged. You see the casino where Professor X, you yeah. know, on the stage. And he realizes what he did. Right. You have the um, the the farmhouse sequence, Jeez. which I think was the best thing in black and white to, yeah. to see. Oh and then you have the the final fight in the woods, you know, on the on mm-hmm. the border, right? Is there any like particular? This is an incredibly violent movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually, yeah. ironically, a very mm-hmm. anti-violence movie. Um, you it's know, because it's violent. showing kind of the fu- futility of it all. But do you have like a particular like moment in Logan that like? really stands out to you as like this is what gets me this is what i love this is what inspires me now there's a lot inspires i think the whole theme is what inspires me not any particular moment but, yeah um maybe professor x's last words were the sun seeker oh yeah and it's interesting they're they're seeking out that ray of light they're seeking out the sun the whole time that's the that was the thing of hope for them but it was yeah. actually ended up being something different but that him breaking down at professor x's funeral um yeah. and just getting mad at the truck and passing out the, the don't be what they made him to be oh, that line that's my favorite line you. and that was so because it's like he's looking at himself and trying to push it into a to push her into a better path. There was, oh, yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying I to Joe, we got teary eyed. Yeah, I saw you. We got teary eyed <laughs> at that part. Sure did. <laughs> Every time, 
Um, oh, and he when he broke when he broke down in front of Laura at the shack when they found all the kids. Uh-huh. Oh, he's yeah. like, I am. I suck at this. Yeah. Like, yeah. Everyone that I care about dies. Like, do not take me with you. It yeah. just sucks that like, like when oh, you get to Days of Future Past them. and they save the future. This is the future they yeah. create. So instead of getting wiped out through like a genocide with sentinels, they get wiped out like Professor subtly. X's bit brain fart and, yeah. and bad food. It's oh, it's it's brain farts and it's bad just like, food. Damn, the mutants <laughs> can't catch a break. Yeah. You know, it is very corn bleak. industry. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. Oh gosh, <laughs> that's it's sad. It is so sad, bro. Yeah, that that's where it goes. But with the violence, I wanted to mention that because um, I think the fans had a lot to do with that because oh yeah mm-hmm. they he never they they never really showed uh, Logan in berserker mode yeah besides and, maybe the apocalypse cameo it, yeah. and and he went full on between his t- yeah. clone and himself the whole they had movie. the full on yeah. berserker oh, mode gosh. and I loved it like sure. you know you kind of always wanted to see yeah. you know him just go nuts. And he did in that. So that's the upside to the violence that I really liked about it. And then her too, X twenty three, yeah, man. Oh yeah. She she's was she's, scary. <laughs> she she was awesome. And I I just I love that part. I, I think I love that part the most about the yeah. um bringing her in because uh-huh. right around that time, um, she's starting to become popular in the comic books. Yeah. Right, right, right. And you know, so it's kind of bringing her in and she is a really cool character. Yeah. So I really yeah. don't think we're ever gonna get anything like Logan again nope. for for X Men in terms of a movie. No. I, I don't think uh, Marvel now, like Disney Marvel, they'll never make it. They'll never do it. There's no way. That might be okay. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know I if think it needs to get back to that point. Yeah, I think. Um, want it to be super. Brutal. And this yeah. is this is maybe a great thing to talk about with the, with it. the movies as a whole. You know, like Logan, that moment when at the last shot, which is one of my favorite last shots in a movie. Where she turns the cross over to the mm-hmm. X and the grave is there. I'm like, you finished. Yeah. You finished. There's no other X Men movies that, need, that to need to happen. And then Dark yeah. Phoenix. And then, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> and then that they did made not Dark happen. Phoenix and that, New Mutants. That, that, those did not happen. Um, oh, man. I think the X Men film series as a whole is interesting because it's a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. It is a huge mixed bag, right? But I think the highs make it worth it. Yeah. Logan, Days of Future Past, First Class, mm-hmm. X2, the best moments in Apocalypse. Yeah. They all make it. I can't say the whole movie, Honestly, but there are. But, I agree. Yeah, but no, there are yeah. top tier moments. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I like the Wolverine origin too. I, mean, I do like. Oh, wait, X Men Origins yeah, Wolverine? It is yeah. A guilty oh player. no. X-Men Origins is a Oh, I get that. Yeah, oh, Deadpool. Yeah. I do like it. <laughs> okay, it's ranking time. It's yeah. ranking time. Uh, we're it's we're gonna show our really, cards it's now. That really makes it too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're gonna show our cards, everybody. So I get your cards out. Um, cards. And this is this is where we'll end. We'll end right here with our rankings. Okay. Kind of the same thing, probably from everyone else. But okay. my tops are X2, Logan. I can't remember the Wolverine, but I like it. I'm gonna it's put good. That yeah, it's the, pretty good. I'm going to put that in the middle, middle, higher of my list. Uh, first class, I really loved. Mm-hmm. Um, I really loved parts of Apocalypse, but I'll put that under Days of Future Past. Mm-hmm. I think for some reason I was zoning out during that movie. So if I watched it and understood it better, I'd put it higher. Which one? Days of Future Past. That's like middle high. Okay. Yeah, I would say maybe above because you've only seen it once, right? Yeah. I'd say yeah, that's a good one to watch again. I was I was spaced out. It actually wasn't like that high of a movie for me the first time I watched it. It actually was about not until the third time where everything was clicking, and I was like, two more times, two more times. (sighs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) I did like The Last Stand. I did. Interesting. They had it had a it had a um, juggernaut. I'm the Juggernaut. <laughs> yeah, and then you know they, made the ju- they made the Juggernaut way cooler in Deadpool too. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh yeah. I was like, oh dang! But then they did a very uncool thing to him. Like, oh, that just kind of ruined. Where would you but, put the Deadpool? Yeah, everybody put your Deadpool movies like in there too. Like how you would put them in here. I can't enjoy them anymore. 
I didn't really enjoy them to begin with anyway. Are are we rating just the movies? Yeah. So I put Deadpool on like its own little category. Like I can't put it in with, with the, the X Men. Yeah, it's just weird. I really me. I liked them, mm-hmm. you know, Second. all on their own thing. Yeah, yeah Ryan Reynolds you is know? like, that's one of the best casting choices yes. ever for a character. Yeah, and I, I just like the the fact that, you know, he was in the, I think it was the Wolverine origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as, as the I, first. Um, iteration of Deadpool. Yeah, Deadpool, yeah. which <laughs> was a terrible version. Yeah, up now. yeah. It, it was a terrible version, but yeah. I do like the fact that, you know, they somehow made that connection. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In the character but i i'd say in if if i had to rate the movies yeah i'd say x2 is my favorite okay um and the wolverine origin is probably my second wow. favorite okay. um just because in the movies wolverine is just so cool yeah uh-huh. i just really love Wolverine. i mean like yeah it's so that's why I, I I liked the getting a little bit of the history about him and, sure. and all that. Yeah. Um. So, and then probably my third favorite would be the Days of Future Past, which I really like that too. Mm, yeah. Cool. So those would be my top three. Okay. Joe, you got yours ready? Yeah, I would do a top five. Um, okay, go for it. Days of Future Past is my first. The then Logan, then Apocalypse, First Class, and then Origins. Hold on, I miss Logan. Wait, Days of Future Past yeah. is your favorite? Yeah. Oh, let's go. Yeah, I really like I that movie. I could watch a whole bunch of times and still feel the emotional impact of it all. Yeah, it's like it just oh yeah. I'm right there with. I you. did forget Logan actually, so, uh, and, Logan, and Logan, Logan would actually be number two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So X. Uh, thank you for having yeah. at least Logan higher X, than X two <laughs> X two then Logan because I, I really that was a great great yeah. movie. Yeah. Um and and then Wolverine Origin and so on. Okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what, what's the worst for you then? What's the worst? Yeah, I if, would. Yeah, uh, I would have to say, I I think Dark Phoenix. Dark it's just, Phoenix. It's just so dumb. Like Dark Phoenix is the most like bare bones adaptation yeah. I've ever seen. It literally like does things in like a very surfacey way, uh-huh. but the meat and core of the story is so spoiled. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. Dave, have you seen it? What would you say about it? I think it it was bad. Yeah. The only wow. thing I would like about that movie is the fact that they did have the Phoenix come out in yep. a flame. Uh huh. Yeah, they which, did. Fi- they did fix that. Yeah, mm-hmm. which that was the only redeeming quality. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't you can't get into the Dark Phoenix without telling the story. Yeah. And, and there's going a lot of space. story that leads up to. Yeah. That. I mean, and they tried to rush it all. Yeah. In one yeah you just can't just. Pop it up in the in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I do like the train scene. That's the, like the only thing. Like when they're all fighting on the train, killing the, the yeah. Supposed I mean, the scrolls. movie has some cool moments. The like them in X Men yeah. in space yeah. is mm-hmm. fun. You know, there's some cool moments. Yeah, yeah. But, it just didn't do. Okay, yeah, it ain't do it. All right, <laughs> all right. Here's my ranking: um, bottom to top. Number twelve. And you can, if you guys are want to learn more about um, what I think of these movies, um, go to my Letterbox account, which is in the show notes. Letterbox. Um, here we go. Number twelve. Sorry, Dave and Joe. X Men Origins Wolverine <laughs> is the bottom. <laughs> bottom. 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 Sorry, right, everybody hates. Um, it's okay. <laughs> besides the opening montage and casting Ryan Reynolds, mm-hmm. I got nothing. Number eleven. <laughs> X Men: The Last Stand. Okay. Um, Aww, sorry, yeah. Jason. I just think that it's. Bad. I like the cure storyline. The cure storyline actually comes from Joss Whedon's run. I think it's a good idea, but what they did with the Dark Phoenix saga and mm-hmm. just it's, mm-hmm. just it's a trash movie. Yeah. Scary. Speaking of Dark Phoenix saga, number ten, Dark, Dark Phoenix. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Dark I, Phoenix has a good score though. The Hans Zimmer score is actually mm-hmm. pretty good. I can't, um, I can't get past just a bad. I know. Yeah. I understand. It's a. It's a, it's the definition of mediocre, awful. Like yeah. right. It just is, and it's sad that that's kind of where it goes. Which why I pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, I actually act like those three movies don't exist. Um, like if I was to watch an X Men marathon, maybe uh-huh. I would watch The Last Stand, but I wouldn't watch Origins or Dark Phoenix. Wow. Sorry. Number nine is X Men Apocalypse, okay. um, which we've already talked about. Number eight is the original X Men. Hmm. Um, no, it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not bad. It's good. Good intro. It's okay. Um, number seven is the Wolverine. Okay. Um, and the director's cut of that is 
actually. I didn't know there's a director. There is. It's too. rated R too. Really? So it actually is like a preview of the things of Logan. Oh, I want to watch that. Yeah, I okay, have it. Cool. I have it. If you ever want to see it, so, so if you want yeah. to borrow it, um, it's longer and it has. It's just more violent. Yeah. Um. So I actually might have got those two movies mixed up. Because I think it is the Wolverine that I like. The Wolverine better. is the Japan one. Yes, that's the one that oh, I like. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Okay. That's more forgiving. Okay. I can, so I, I think, I, yeah, I think I got those mixed up. Then what would yeah. Logan be then? And your, I guess. Um, would it Logan would still, still be higher? Logan would still be higher, okay. yes. Yeah, the Wolverine. I like the Wolverine yeah. where he goes to Japan and, yes. you know, yeah, that's, that's what Origins the, is with Sabretooth in it where uh, they have a team together. and he, you know, I really like that movie. Yeah. I still like that movie. It was but, fun. But yeah. I think as far as rankings, I was thinking about the whole Japanese story. Yeah, and, okay, yeah. Because there's a whole comic book yeah. Yeah, line that's a, with yes. that, too. Yeah, that's they even rip an image right out of the comic where Wolverine um, has all those arrows. That, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, number six is Deadpool 1. Okay. Um, yeah, it's funny. Freaking hilarious. <laughs> um, number five, X2. Um, and when I get like to six and five here, like this is like when we're like at some really good movies, you uh-huh. know? Um, so X2 is number five. The only reason why it's not higher is because as we shared earlier with God loves man kills, yeah. the comic book is so superior Yeah, and I just, it's hard for me to, you know, but it's got Nightcrawler in it. So I'm pretty cool with that. Yes. <laughs> number four, Deadpool two. Really? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Deadpool two might be the funniest, the hardest I've ever laughed in a movie. Hmm. It is so dang funny. Like, yeah, it's had some really hard moments. Like when his head hits the rock when he falls off, that would hurt. Yeah. To watch. Well, it has some heart too. Like it has a lot of heart mm-hmm. in the movie, which I like. There's there's a lot of oh gosh, it's so funny. Colossus Every, really. Cool. Colossus yeah. is yeah. funny. Yeah. I, I love that Colossus and Juggernaut fought. That was like a big yeah. thing in the yeah. comics. Mm-hmm. It was them always fighting, and I love like the X Force scene and just. Oh and man! Brad Pitt. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, just yeah. showing up in the last. Yeah. That if you want to see me like cry, laugh, like hysterical, we watch that movie. <laughs> yes, okay. I, yeah. Number three is X Men First Class. Okay. Incredibly sleek, stylish. Love the '60s setting. Um, so good. Um, number two, which I actually think is the best movie on a technical level of the series, is Logan. Is Logan. Right? Mm-hmm. And number one, future Days Man. of Future Past, yep. specifically the Road Cut. So. We are going to end it here with X-Men, gentlemen. This has been a ball. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. X-Men is great. Um, if you haven't checked out X-Men, you know, movies, comics, shows, all the shows are good. Um, some of the movies are, you know, um, comics, you know, and, and, and everything's hit or miss, but it is worth your time. Um, another thing that we kind of hinted to, but didn't talk about too much is just X-Men has strong female characters as well. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So I've talked about how, like, I'm not like a big fan of like Captain Marvel or like some of those, but like X-Men's female characters, mm-hmm. top tier. Yep. So thank you guys so much for checking out the All Things Narrative Podcast. Don't forget to check out Joseph's stop motion films on YouTube as well, which links will be in the show notes. And, um, yeah, I think the next time we'll do it, be all back doing an episode. Hopefully Nick will be there too. We'll be in December. Yeah. Um, where we just are going to do a free for all. Really? That's gonna be yeah. Fun. I don't know. So we're, we're going to basically, it'll be two things. So number one, what is any like major popular franchise that we have not talked about this year that you want to talk about? Uh-huh. And what is something that you either want to like say that you didn't get to say in a previous episode or something you want to go back and yeah. address or talk more about? So it'll be fun yeah um should be a good time so thank you so much um this is your friendly narrative practitioner derek saying say it joe hashtag mutant and proud to the uprising death to all (laughs) muties striker (laughs) sun seeker (laughs) oh man don't be what they made you (laughs) i have some good opening closing line to go out of